With recent cases like Michael Brown and Eric Garner, it's hard to believe that some people think we live in a post-racial society when racist attitudes and systemic oppression still persist. In the article titled Post-War American Cities, it explains that blacks have been and are still victims of systemic exclusion, targeted police harassment, disenfranchisement, racial stigmas, isolation from other populations, concentrated poverty, oppression through policy, legislation, and cultural denigration, a lack of economic capital, and the overall lack of representation in government in order to address these issues. The problem is that, for centuries in the United States, blacks themselves have been thought of as disposable and excrescence in the body politic and thus part of the problem. And I'd argue that although the George discrimination has been outlawed, there is still a prominent structural and organized bias in American society where race and class remain inextricably linked. And the question is not whether race or class perpetuates the urban underclass, but how race and class interact to undermine the social and economic well-being of black Americans. Unfortunately, there are still discriminatory impacts of U.S. policy and inextricable connections between race, wealth, political rights, and political power. And some white Americans today don't even believe that their positions on current issues have a racist undertone because perhaps they aren't overtly racist. I bring this up because in the article titled Colored Property and White Backlash, it explains that in the 1960s, any person of European descent was encouraged to develop a new vocabulary about white privilege and its relationship to economic growth, property, responsible government, and the rights of homeowners. Now, some people, namely white Americans, are either blinded by their privilege or choose to remain ignorant. But like the article Black Trash states, the political history of the United States has been one of systemic racial domination by the white majority. And I'd argue that at the root of this issue is the social contract, or what Charles Mills calls the racial contract. This contract is an exclusionary agreement among the subset of the population to establish themselves as white persons, to regard themselves as superior to non-white subpersons, and to develop a moral code and political apparatus that codify and embed this racial superiority in the everyday functioning of the polity. And this racial state state acts on behalf of white citizenry. The only way that there can be effective change is if white people recognize their privilege and stand up. As Haggerty mentions in her article on white shame, white people need to take responsibility for this systemized racism. A kind of responsibility that includes a concept of moral taint, a condition for the possibility of white shame. We need to recognize the wrongful benefits of white skin privilege and the oppression of black people. Because we are responsible when we do nothing, and silence is just another form of consent.